COVID-19 is less severe in children. Most have mild infections or are asymptomatic. Some, however, have long-term problems after recovering from an infection. Extreme tiredness, shortness of breath, memory loss, and underperforming in school. You're seeing a considerable number of young people who are not only infected, but who are seriously ill. Again, the numbers compared to the elderly are less, yeah. but that's a false comparison. These kids are getting sick. Should children get vaccinated then? Brazil, Canada, Japan, and many other countries have already begun inoculating children over the age of 12. The UK is waiting for more data to see if kids should be offered the jab. To jab or not to jab? That's the question facing many politicians and parents. I'm Ben Fazul and welcome. In a moment, I'll talk to an expert from Oxford. First, this report from southern Germany. Katarina knows just where and how she caught the coronavirus while at a friend's on October 29, 2020. The 15-year-old's life has been an awful ordeal since then. I still have really bad shortness of breath and also frequent headaches and pains in my limbs and lungs. And I can't concentrate. On some days, I can't get out of bed. And of course, there are moments when I feel down. Katarina's doctor is Peter Ilsinger, who says her case is far from an exception. He's been treating over 30 young people suffering from long COVID symptoms. In my practice, I see a lot of parents with teenagers who don't know where else to go. They've already been to other doctors and clinics. And unfortunately, a lot of parents and children were not taken seriously. But just how common is long COVID among children and teenagers? The short answer is, frustratingly, that nobody knows. One of the few options for youngsters in Germany is this children's hospital in Munich, where specialists are only just beginning to understand long COVID among the young. It's an age group with very few severe cases of COVID, but there are regular instances of long COVID, especially among teenagers, and the sheer range of symptoms makes it difficult to provide either a diagnosis or a therapy. Right now we have very little to offer in terms of therapy. There's still a lot of research to be done. And making a diagnosis is also very complicated, of course. So providing a proper analysis requires a very large number of specialists. The data available are thin on the ground, comprising a handful of scientific studies with disparate results. Amid ongoing uncertainty, there is now hope from a study being conducted by the Children's Clinic at Erlangen's University Hospital. An MRI scan is used to visualize changes in the patient's lungs, while complex blood analyses are performed to display possible cell damage. With children, there may also be issues that we can't see properly. Our study aims to provide new insights in this area, such as what scars and infection leave behind in the body of a child or a teenager. The doctors hope to gain a better picture of long COVID among young patients in order to help those affected. As for Katarina, she's essentially lost nine months of her young life to COVID. And while hoping her ordeal will soon be over, she's now looking forward to getting back to life as normal and to be able to go back to school in September, just like any other 15-year-old. Let's bring in Dominic Wilkinson, a professor of medical ethics. Before we get to the ethics, what do we know about long COVID in kids, because doctors say youths with mild or even asymptomatic infections may experience long COVID. Yes, that's right. Uh, the studies uh, on long COVID in kids suggest that a, a small proportion of, of kids have symptoms that continue for weeks or even months after an initial infection. I think that the best evidence that we have to date suggests that this is less common uh, than in adults, that, that the majority of kids' uh, symptoms are short-lived, that their symptoms resolve within a week, and that perhaps only 2% of children have symptoms that continue for more than two months. So I think that, that, that uh, although this is, is certainly a concern, it's less common than in, than in young adults or, or other adults. Does it make sense then to vaccinate children to ensure they don't get something like long COVID? 
Well, the, there are uh, a range of different reasons why we might want to vaccinate kids. We might want to vaccinate them to stop them getting acutely ill, uh, the rate of acute severe illness being in hospital or even dying is very low in kids. That's good news. We might want to vaccinate them to prevent uh, long COVID or, or other forms of illness. We might want to vaccinate them to prevent disruption to their education. We might want to vaccinate them to protect other people. So there's a range of good reasons why we might want to vaccinate kids. In Germany, there's no official vaccination recommendation for children and adolescents aged between 12 and 17, only those at special risk. In the US, the CDC recommends vaccination without restrictions. Is there a right or wrong in that case? Well, there are two different uh, questions. So, so one is what what's the relative risk of uh, uh, of COVID for kids, what's the risk of the vaccine? And so does the, the risks outweigh the benefits for kids of having the vaccine? That's a scientific question. Then there's an ethical question about whether it's the right thing to do to give the vaccine, given what we know. The US have taken the approach that given this is generally a safe vaccine, that they've accumulated data, um, that COVID can be severe in kids, that the, the best thing to do is to offer the vaccine to kids other countries have taken a more cautious approach, like Germany and the UK, and said, this is this is a milder illness in kids. Sorry, we, we just lost you there for a second. Uh, let me pick up on the risk of the vaccine itself. What about the potential side effects on children? I mean, how long until something like that is known? So that's a very good question. And one of the main reasons to be cautious is the possibility that you roll out a vaccine and then find uh, rare, severe side effects. Uh, and the worry is that not only would that threaten vaccine confidence in the wider community in relation to COVID, that it might actually affect people's confidence in our wider vaccination programs, which are enormously important. So what would you advise parents uh, who have the chance to vaccinate their children? Well, I think if the vaccine's been approved and is available for adolescents, uh, I think that, that parents uh, can be reassured that the evidence suggests that this is a safe thing to do and that it will help the young person uh, protect themselves and protect uh, those around them. So uh, I think if this is, if this is available, that, that it is something that I would support I think there's a separate question about whether it should be available. Mm -hmm. um, the big question then, uh, will we get this pandemic under control without vaccinating children? Um, so that's partly about whether we need to vaccinate children to achieve a high enough immunity level to protect other members of the community. So this idea of herd immunity. Uh, we certainly can achieve very high levels, potentially, of, of immunity within the population uh, without vaccinating children. Uh, in, in the UK, more than 75% of adults have now had two doses of the vaccine, and there are very high levels of antibodies among those who, who haven't yet been vaccinated, including children. But because this virus we've already seen has a, 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 a tendency to, to mutate, uh, it's not clear that we can achieve, uh, in practice, something like herd immunity. So it may not be necessary or helpful to vaccinate children in order to protect the wider community. Professor of Medical Ethics, Dominic Wilkinson, thank you very much for being on the show today. You're welcome. Your turn to ask the questions now. Here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Can vaccines affect your menstruation cycles? I'll tell you up front again, uh, the answer is once more, we don't know. But this is yet another of those questions that's really worth some discussion. So let's look at it. A small percentage of women, um, under 1%, according to the reliable sources that I read, uh, those women who received COVID-19 vaccines have reported on social media and via side effect tracking apps that they experienced subsequent 
short-term changes in menstruation. Um, often the complaints were of heavier than usual bleeding or, or changes in cycles. The problem is anecdotal reports like those in and of themselves don't really prove anything. If, if there really is a link to vaccines, it would have to be verified through observations in studies. Uh, the large-scale clinical trials that led to the authorization of vaccines focused mostly on whether more serious side effects could occur. They didn't really track things like menstrual irregularities. Which is not to say that for a few women at least, a link doesn't exist, just that it would be hard to prove, experts say, because menstruation can be influenced by a wide range of other factors as well, not least stress. And there's, there's certainly enough of that to go around in this pandemic. Um, that's, that's just one reason why demonstrating clear causality would be pretty difficult. But, but by its very nature, the female reproductive system is certainly influenced by the immune system in major ways. So a lot of experts don't rule out the idea that a vaccine might have an impact on menstruation, although pretty much all of them also say that even if it did, the effect would almost certainly only be a short-term one. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and see you again soon.